Hello, everybody, and welcome to a special March Madness edition of Backfired, an NBA history podcast about bad teams, bad luck, and bad decisions. My name is Lewis, and today we are going to talk about a guy who had one of the great peaks that a college player can have and then went on to do absolutely nothing in the NBA despite being a high draft pick and seemingly having all the tools that he would need to build a respectable NBA career for himself. That would be Ed O'Bannon from the UCLA Bruins, the 1995 national champions. That is the last time that the Bruins won an NCAA championship. Will that change this year? Who's to say? They've got Drew Pember and the UNC Asheville Bulldogs hoping to make that a no for this year. Uh, I'm very excited for this year's tournament because of my beloved Memphis Tigers. That is the fight song that I used in the intro and outro. Maybe I could have used the UCLA one for a UCLA guys episode, but I used to work for the Tigers. I love them, so uh, I got to will their success into existence. They're a good candidate to dethrone number one Purdue if they reach the second round. They very nearly beat Gonzaga last year, but fell to Drew Timmy's strong second half. So hopefully if, if they reach the second round this year, they're able to beat Zach Eady and the Purdue Boilermakers. We'll see how things go. We did beat Houston without Marcus Sasser. That was the first time in program history that we ever beat the number one team in the nation. So that was awesome. I was definitely a little teary-eyed seeing Penny Hardaway cut down the nets. Hopefully he and the Tigers will get to cut down some more nets in a few weeks. Uh, there will be chances to beat a lot of my ops en route to a title. Tennessee, Kentucky, Kansas. It would be pretty sweet. Not saying it's even remotely likely, but I sure would love it. But uh, hey, speaking of the Nets, let's talk about Ed O'Bannon and specifically his career progression at UCLA before talking about the NBA. So Ed O'Bannon is from Lakewood, California, which to me looks like it's basically Los Angeles. I'm sure any uh, LA-based listeners are ripping their hair out right now. But O'Bannon committed initially to play for Jerry Tarkanian and the UNLV Runnin' Rebels, the 1990 NCAA champions. But in 1990... UNLV was banned from the postseason in 1991 due to recruiting violations that occurred in 1977 that the university had already been punished for, it, it seems, based on what I'm reading. So it seems kind of like a double jeopardy situation. But regardless, Ed O'Bannon had not signed a letter of intent at UNLV because Tarkanian advised him not to, which wound up being a very smart move. So O'Bannon was able to reopen his recruitment and eventually commit to the hometown team, UCLA. And by the way, UNLV was eventually unbanned from the postseason and made the Final Four in 1991. Almost pulled off an undefeated season, but lost to Duke in the Final Four, finished 34-1. So O'Bannon committed to play at UCLA to play for Jim Herrick, but just a few days before the start of practice in his freshman season, disaster struck as he tore his ACL in a pickup game. He said that he had slipped on some water while going toward the basket. He got up and uh, walked off the court by himself, but the MRI revealed that he was going to be out for at least a year. He had torn his ACL. Doctors told him that he may never be able to play basketball again. The time in ACL tear was much more of a severe injury than it's thought of as now, where you may miss 10 to 12 months, but then a lot of guys tend to come back and within a, a month or two be back to normal. But O'Bannon was probably going to be a starter his freshman season. UCLA had depth, but not quality depth at the power forward position. And O'Bannon was a premier prospect. I mean, he was considered to be one of the top players in the class, in a class that had Grant Hill, it had Penny Hardaway. So O'Bannon was the real deal. So this, this was a huge blow to UCLA. In O'Bannon's absence, they had a respectable season, but still lost in the first round to the 13th seed, Penn State, the Nittany Lions' best season since 1955, and their first NCAA tournament appearance since 1965. That certainly is a low point for UCLA losing to Penn State, but O'Bannon was able to return, get some playing time in his redshirt freshman season, only played about 12, 13 minutes a game. But in his sophomore year, he really came on the scene, put up about 16 and a half points, seven rebounds. His junior season, he went for 18 points and nine rebounds. And then finally in his senior year, his fifth year in college, he had a dream season, only lost two games that entire year, one to Oregon and the other to Cal. The loss to Cal was later reversed due to NCAA violations committed by head coach Todd Bozeman of Cal. So officially, UCLA finished the season 32-1 in the NCAA tournament, defeated the following teams, Florida International University, Missouri, Mississippi State, UConn with Ray Allen, 
Big Country Bryant Reeves and the Oklahoma State Cowboys in the Final Four. And then finally, after 40 minutes of hell, came out on top over the defending champions, the University of Arkansas Razorbacks, powered by Corliss Williamson and legendary head coach Nolan Richardson. Now that is an iconic run, beating UConn with a future Hall of Famer on the roster, beating Oklahoma State with a premier center prospect, and then knocking out the defending champs. But O'Bannon didn't just win an NCAA championship, he also won first-team All-Pac-10 honors his sophomore, junior, and senior seasons, first-team All-American his senior year, Pac-10 Co-Player of the Year with Arizona's Damon Stoudemire, the Wooden Award, and the NCAA Tournament Most Outstanding Player Award after averaging 19 points and 9 rebounds in the tournament and closing out his college career with 30 points and 17 rebounds against Arkansas. So that's pretty much the perfect season, even with UCLA losing a game or two. Um, you, you really can't ask for much better. I know that UCLA has had four undefeated seasons and won 10 championships in 12 years at one point, but uh, we are not going to let perfect be the enemy of great here. So after a stellar college career, of course, it was time for O'Bannon to cash in on his skill and head to the NBA. So let me tell you first the NBA draft order after the draft lottery. So you've got the Golden State Warriors, who jumped up to the number one pick with the fifth best odds to do so. The Los Angeles Clippers at number two, by far the worst team in the league in the 1995 season. The Philadelphia 76ers at number three, still reeling from trading Charles Barkley to the Phoenix Suns a couple years back. The Washington Bullets at number four. Minnesota Timberwolves at number five. The two Canadian expansion teams, Vancouver and Toronto, at 6 and 7. Vancouver chose to take the earlier pick in the NBA draft and the later pick in the expansion draft. The Detroit Pistons at number 8. They've got Grant Hill in tow, but they still aren't very good. The New Jersey Nets at number 9. The Miami Heat at 10. Milwaukee Bucks at 11. Dallas Mavs at 12. And then rounding things out at 13, the Sacramento Kings. So in the pre-draft process, he's thought of as being one of the next tier down from the top three players in the draft who are Joe Smith, Rashid Wallace, and Jerry Stackhouse. Still considered a great prospect talent-wise, but not really in contention for a top three pick. Could go reasonably anywhere from number four to Washington or slip to like number 10 or 11, Miami or Milwaukee. But it would have been a shock for him to go much lower than 11. But anything is possible, of course. So Joe Smith out of Maryland went first. He was the odds-on favorite. Things got a little shaken up when the LA Clippers salary dumped the number two pick to the Denver Nuggets. They used it on Antonio McDice out of Alabama. Tiny bit of a reach at number two, but from the uh, from the Nuggets perspective, nobody else in the top five was salary dumping a high lottery pick except for the Clippers. So, you know, throw the pre-draft expected draft position out of the window. They wanted McDice. They got McDice. The 76ers got their guy, Jerry Stackhouse, at number three. They were going to trade down if Stackhouse was not available and probably pick up O'Bannon. That's what the coaches of the 76ers were quoted as saying in a couple newspapers. The Washington Bullets got lucky and Rasheed Wallace dropped to them, so they got a top three talent with the number four pick. The Minnesota Timberwolves selected a high schooler. What's up with that? A high school senior named Kevin Garnett. The Grizzlies selected Bryant Reeves. They wanted to get a head start on developing a center. So we're through six picks already, and there was no real spot after the top three for O'Bannon. So the Bullets went with the best player available. The Timberwolves had just acquired Tom Gugliotta in the 1995 season. He was playing the small forward position. He was a combo forward. And the Grizzlies were set on drafting a center. They were just debating internally whether to go with Big Country or with Cherokee Parks out of Duke. So it wasn't until number seven, the Toronto Raptors, that there seemed to be a natural spot for O'Bannon. So like the Grizzlies, the Raptors basically had zero players. They'd done the expansion draft, but you're not going to not pick you know, a talented guy at a certain position just because somebody's end of the bench guy fell to you in the expansion draft. So Toronto really took a hard look at O'Bannon. Here's where the draft, which was taking place in Toronto, got pretty interesting. The fans of the Raptors, who of course hadn't played a game yet. The fans in Canada really didn't know any of the players in the top of the draft except for O'Bannon because he was the best player on the team that won the championship. So there were hundreds of people in the Sky Dome in Toronto chanting for the Raptors to pick O'Bannon uh, and booing when they selected his Pac-10 co-player of the year, Damon Stoudemire, instead because they had never heard of him. They only knew O'Bannon. Now, the eighth pick had gone to the Detroit Pistons, but after doing their due diligence, they figured Cherokee Parks was going to be available for them. Parks was a center and power forward prospect, but after talking with his former Duke teammate, Grant Hill, they learned that Parks was a little bit of a party animal 
and they decided to just trade out of the pick. So they went to the Portland Trailblazers, traded the pick, got Otis Thorpe in return. He was an all-star power forward who'd won an NBA title in Houston in 1994, starting alongside Hakeem Olajuwon. I talked about Thorpe's trade to the Vancouver Grizzlies in episode 30 of this podcast, so go check that out. He completely fucked them over in the 1997-98 season. Portland used that pick that they acquired from the Pistons to draft Sean Respert, a dead-eye shooter who was the top scorer in the history of Michigan State University. Respert was absolutely insane in college, a career 48-45-86 shooter. 45% from three is crazy. But uh, that sort of set things up nicely for the New Jersey Nets, who had the number nine pick and were in desperate need of a lot of things, but especially a small forward, shooting guard, swing man kind of guy with the departure of Chris Morris, a talented, malcontent type. The Nets picked him number four overall in the 1988 draft. He once refused to enter a game for the Nets when they were just one game shy of clinching the playoffs. The Nets did win their final game of the year that year to make it in, but still he this guy clashed a ton with Bill Fitch, who was the coach of the Nets at the time, clashed with Jerry Sloan of the Jazz when he joined Utah later. He demanded a trade in the 95 season, but was not granted one. The way that he demanded that trade was very funny. I've never seen this before. He wrote, trade me on the side of one shoe and please on the other. So he was very polite about it. But Chris Morris made it clear that he was not going to return to the Nets. He was an unrestricted free agent, so the Nets really wanted to get a replacement for him. But they were pretty devoid of talent as it was. They were uh, soon going to be trading Derek Coleman, the former number one overall pick. They lost Benoit Benjamin to the Grizzlies in the expansion draft, which they were actually pretty happy about. They had Rick Mahorn of the Bad Boy Pistons, but he was just getting older and less effective. O'Bannon really just slid right into one of the many needs they had. And so I'll clarify something. I talked about O'Bannon in college as a power forward because he was six foot eight. He was too, he was thought of in the pre-draft process as a small forward because he was going to be slightly too small to play against power forwards. And a lot of people thought that he had shooting potential, but as would soon become an issue, he was too slow to play against power forwards and shooting guards. And part of that was uh, the reason why the Nets were able to get him at number nine in the first place was that teams were not particularly happy with the news that they got about Ed O'Bannon's knee. He had, you know, miraculously come back from his knee surgery where the doctors told him he may never play basketball again. And he came back to play 117 consecutive games in college. But NBA medical staffs just didn't really like what they saw, particularly the Nets. But they still took a swing on him anyway, figuring that he was going to be a better shot for them to replace Chris Morris, and he had the talent to become a really good value pick for them. So O'Bannon was confident in his own abilities, of course, and he conveyed to the Nets what he said when he was drafted, which was, quote, I know my knee and what I can do. It can hold up for 82 games. And there were other guys on the board like Eric Williams, Brent Berry, Michael Finley. I think Finley, in hindsight, may have been a, a good option for them. But Willis Reed, the GM of the New Jersey Nets, was no stranger to taking risks. He had drafted Yinka Dare the year before. Dare, as it turned out, needed surgeries on both knees, played only one game that season. So Reed went with O'Bannon, which turned out not to be such a good idea for the second year in a row because O'Bannon just never put it together in the NBA. He was not great in the preseason. He did show some flashes of, of fun and greatness in games here and there. He would, you know, get a steal and throw down a big dunk. He had 14 points in the Nets home opener, got fairly consistent minutes for the first part of the season. But as Michael James at the New York Daily News wrote, it was getting harder at the end of the first month of his career to see what Butch Beard, the new head coach of the Nets, was saying that he was satisfied with from O'Bannon. He earned the starting spot, actually, after the All-Star break, even after separating his shoulder and missing 10 games. But in those starts, his numbers just didn't pop, although he's playing more minutes. He went from 5.7 points and 2.5 rebounds off the bench to 7 points and 3 rebounds, basically just scaling up with the increase in minutes. But like I said, he just never put things together. But that's his rookie season. NBA players, by and large, are not very good in their rookie years. It's, it's tough to adjust instantly from college to the pros. Now, in O'Bannon's second season in New Jersey, he had a new coach and a new GM. They were the same person. That was John Calipari, the former UMass head coach. Now, John Calipari is the coach and GM, of course, made all the decisions when it came to the New Jersey Nets. So he started at O'Bannon at the beginning of the year to, quote, keep his confidence going. 
Now, it wasn't unearned. He had shot 50% from the field and from three in preseason, shot a ton of threes in those few games. 18 of his 40 shot attempts in the preseason were from three. And that's what the Nets needed was perimeter shooting. But once the regular season started, O'Bannon's game just fell off a cliff and he was pretty vocally upset about having earned the starting job in camp and preseason and then losing it after only five games. One of those starts, he played less than six minutes and wasn't given the call during crunch time against the Orlando Magic in Tokyo when he was seen as one of the better three-point shooters on the roster. And it just frustrated him. And soon enough, he was in Calipari's doghouse. He had a really uneven minutes load. He got DNP CDs every once in a while and he, he would go from playing 20 minutes a night for, you know, a two-week stretch to playing 20 total minutes in the next week. And, you know, it, it, it's funny. Well, it's not funny, but it, it's coincidental that part of the reason that for his minutes fluctuating like that is that the Nets just kept bringing in players to try to usurp him, and they would either be really old and play worse than O'Bannon, or they would get injured. Guys like Xavier McDaniel or David Benoit, who had been a, a starter in Utah the last two years. O'Bannon accidentally stepped on Benoit's leg and tore his Achilles in the process of Benoit's Achilles. So guys would either be worse than O'Bannon or would get injured, meaning O'Bannon would have to step in for them. Now, O'Bannon was not the only guy getting this treatment from Calipari. There was also Sean Bradley, a.k.a. the Stormin' Mormon, who was in trade rumors from the second Calipari got to town. Even though the New Jersey Nets had just acquired Bradley at the trade deadline in O'Bannon's rookie season. Of course, Willis Reed, the former GM, made that acquisition, not Calipari. But the New York Daily News rated Ed O'Bannon as the player that Calipari wanted to trade the most on the roster, second only to Yankadare, who was about as untradeable as they come due to his injury and his pretty high salary. But while Dare survived on the Nets past that season, Sean Bradley and Ed O'Bannon did not, as the two of them, plus Robert Pack and Khalid Reeves, were sent to the Dallas Mavericks in exchange for five players. Sam Cassell, Chris Gatling, Jim Jackson, George McLeod, and Eric Montross. Now, just on paper, that's a pretty good deal for the Nets. They, they had to send out their entire point guard rotation, but Sam Cassell was a great point guard. Chris Gatling technically was an all-star that year. He was the odds-on leader for six-man of the year, led Dallas in scoring at 19 points per game. Dallas was horrible that year. He was one of many injury replacement all-stars that year, but still goes down in the record books as an all-star. Jim Jackson could put the ball in the basket. The Nets flipped George McLeod a few days later to get some more stuff. So it's not a horrible trade. But once he was in Dallas, Ed O'Bannon was just a nine-minute-a-night guy and only played in 19 of the 35 games that he was considered active. After his second season, he was traded to the Orlando Magic, who waived him in training camp. And that was the end of his NBA career, for all intents and purposes. He did get a training camp invite in Orlando again in the year 2000, but he was waived before the regular season. O'Bannon spent most of his playing career playing overseas. He played in Italy, Spain, Greece, Argentina, Poland, and then once he made it to China, he decided to call it quits. He got one final knee surgery and then just started selling cars instead. As I've said many times, I, I surely would not mind getting to play in Italy or Spain or Buenos Aires as O'Bannon got to do, but it is, you know, I, I will admit, a bit of a step down reputation-wise from playing on the New Jersey Nets. Now, the primary reason why he didn't work out in the NBA, you may think it would be his knee, but he only ever went on the injured list for knee soreness one time, and it's not even clear if that was a real injury or just one of those trade deadline sit-out things because he was traded just a couple days later. O'Bannon kept it simple and attributed it to a lack of confidence stemming from his inconsistent minutes and his short leash, which a lot of players in the NBA have complained about over the years. Some coaches are so quick to pull somebody from the game after a missed shot or a key turnover, which I do get. But I see the player's perspective more, you know, if the punishment comes after just one or two mistakes, you get in your head and then more mistakes come as a result. And, it, you know, it's just a snowball effect. So it can be unfair, but that is the pros. His former teammate Armin Gilliam was quoted as saying, Ed O'Bannon is a guy who never found his niche in the NBA. He wasn't in the right situation to grow and develop. He never got the opportunity to prove what he could do. And that's so true to me. The uh, the situation can be so important for a player. You know, if, if conditions aren't perfect, they can just be one of the many guys left behind who seem like they have greatness ahead of them. But the wrong coach, the wrong teammates, an injury at a, at a key moment, you know, anything like that, it can screw things up. And I'm sure that that's what happened with Ed O'Bannon. Uh, but he went from bona fide March Madness star to an NBA bust. 
how many guys in this upcoming draft are going to follow the same path? Who will be the breakout star of March Madness or just the star? It doesn't have to be, you know, somebody coming into the national spotlight for the first time. But it'll be interesting to see. For the time being, though, I'm going to get out of your hair, get out of your podcast feeds, but I appreciate you listening to this episode. I think next episode I'll do another March Madness-themed episode, probably maybe like a, I don't know, Jimmer Fredette or Adam Morrison or somebody like that. But we shall see. I may not talk about anything even remotely rated, related to uh, a March Madness star who turned into a bus, but we'll have to see where the wind takes me. But uh, anyway, thank you again. Hope you enjoyed. Follow the show on social media at Backfired NBA Pod on Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter. And we will talk again in a couple weeks. All right, go Tigers.